Well, welcome yeah. to Contemporary Issues this evening. We should probably get started, shouldn't we? We are in our second week, chapter one of uh, Hunting Magic Eels. Uh, we're going to talk about the slow death of God this week. I bet you're thrilled. So I want to begin uh, with an enchantment practice. We're talking about enchanting uh, our experience of faith in the world. So I want you to um, just kind of make yourself comfortable uh, as you are able and maybe take a deep breath just uh, feel God welcoming you into their presence. And then let your attention just kind of flow back over your day. Just be aware of what has happened so far this evening. What happened this afternoon? What happened this morning? And recognize those events, those interactions, those experiences that have stood out to you uh, during this last day. And notice your emotions through this day. Notice when you were angry, when you were stressed, when you were impatient, when you were ashamed or sad or guilty. Notice too when you were peaceful, when you were joyful when you felt relaxed, when you felt whole. Notice your words and your actions. Notice when you spoke harshly, when you said or did something that hurt someone else. Notice when you gave encouragement or kindness. And as you reflect on those moments, <laughs> notice when you were being drawn toward God. Notice when you were being drawn toward God. And notice when you were being drawn away from God. Friends, remember that God is present with us even when we are facing away from God. And let this moment of silence be a prayer of thanks for the ways that we have faced toward God today. Amen. So we were talking, uh, we will be talking about contemplative enchantment later in class today. Um, and so this is, uh, this was a contemplative practice for us. Um, Bev. Is that chapter seven? That is chapter seven. Right, the eczema. That's right. Look at Bev. Oh, she's got a pretty paper for it and everything. Mm, Is that good? See? 
And we will talk about kind of what that means as a practice, what that does to us. Meaning is, meaning is a silly thing and only Christians care about it. Um, we're going to talk about what that does as a practice. Um, but first, we're going to talk about how God is dead. Are you ready? Um, and we're going to talk really specifically about the how of this. So we're going to talk about how Christianity killed its own experience of God. Um, again, Richard Beck is a Christian. He is theistic. He does believe in God. But he's going to say that, that we have killed our experience of God. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about um, specifically um, Western European American Protestantism, um, both because that has been the dominant um, the dominant stream of Christianity um, really uh, throughout much of Europe and pretty much all of the United States, um, uh, especially if you aggregate all of those bazillion different denominations together. Um, uh, so it's been dominant in this process of the slow death of God, and it, it is where I come from, where most of us come from. So... Um, we're gonna start with some numbers. You always love it when I throw percentages at you. So uh, in October, 2019, the Pew Research Center, which studies um, trends in public opinion, including religion, but that's not why they're called Pew. Um, they uh, published a study saying that yes, Christianity is definitively in decline in the United States. Raise your hand if you're shocked. <laughs> so, Whereas, um, you know about the generations, right? Um, so whereas 84% of the silent generation, that is Eleanor and Norma's generation, um, they're actually just a little bit greatest and there's a, slight, there's a silent right behind them actually. Um, uh, but those who are just like creeping into their 90s, um, are the, the silent generation, about 84% of the silent generation identified as Christian in October, 2019. Among millennials, that was 49%. 49% of millennials in the United States identify as Christian. 40% of millennials identify as nothing in particular. Don't even put a label on me. I'm not, this is not even a relevant category for me. Um, so there's a big generational shift, um, but that generational shift is also telegraphing a, an overall shift population-wide because that's what generations do. So 26% of the total population of the United States identified as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. 26% of the total population of the United States identified as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. That was not the case 500 years ago, right? You weren't there for it, but uh, 500 years ago, the world was definitely enchanted. God definitely existed. Demons existed. Demons messed with us, right? And angels helped us and miracles happened. But then there were two big uh, historical shifts in the way that we thought. Uh, there was the scientific revolution and the protestant reformation that um these two big sort of trends in in western thought so the scientific revolution changed the way that we think about how the world works so 1687 with or without an actual apple falling on his head newton publishes uh, his Principia, which is the big sort of magnum opus about how science works um, and how physics works. Um, and now when I say that the scientific revolution is one of the parts of what made for the death of God, that's not to say that science is bad for your faith. Um, Christians who think science is bad for your faith, they are bad for your faith. But science is not bad for your faith. Newton was a committed Christian. He spent um, much of his energy on finding secret codes in the Bible. Um, uh, but the problem with 
the sort of the shift to Newton's understanding of the universe is that it made us start to see the cosmos like a machine, like clockwork. Um, so, you know, the planets move around like billiard balls on a table, nothing's pushing them, they're just doing it. Um, uh, everything, everything in the universe fits together, all the physical laws work together. Um, you may be familiar with that argument for we know God exists because the, the universe is so complicated. It's like if you found a watch and if you found the watch and it was so intricately put together, you would know that there must be a watchmaker, right? Um, well, that's great, except that a well-functioning watch no longer needs its watchmaker. And so whether you, whether you intellectually buy the idea that God exists or not, you when you start thinking about, well, I can tell God exists because everything fits together like clockwork, give that a few generations and the, the clockwork is working and nobody needs the watchmaker anymore on an, on an experiential level, right? We're talking on an experiential level, not a, not a doctrine level. Um, so, um, so we had this scientific revolution that, um, that learned that the universe fits together in these amazing ways, and it's, it does, and, and science is wonderful, right? Um, science is why we all have vaccines now. This is great. I'm thrilled. And um, if we are used to having God be the stuff science can't explain, and because science works, we're using that to point to God, then pretty soon the scientific approach starts to either reduce God to really nothing or mean that we don't really need God even if we, even if we believe he's out there somewhere. So that's what the scientific revolution did uh, to faith, uh, did to the enchanted universe. Um, the Protestant Reformation was no help. Um, so the Protestant Reformation um, in 1517, Luther puts his 95 discussion points up on the door of the church in Wittenberg. Um, and, and really, over the next few centuries, um, this Protestant tradition really does a number on the, the enchanted uh, understanding that, that people had inherited from the, the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, and the Roman Catholic tradition, part of the reason that this contemplative enchantment that I shared with us at the beginning comes to us from the Catholic tradition is that the, the Catholic tradition has kept its hand in that enchanted world a little bit better than the Protestant tradition has. Um, it hasn't been perfect at that either. Um, and it hasn't been perfect for, for other reasons either, neither have we. But um, there are ways in which Catholic practice is still really deeply enchanted. So think about a, a, a Roman Catholic sanctuary and covenants sanctuary, not on Sunday morning, but on like Tuesday afternoon. So Tuesday afternoon, you walk into covenants sanctuary and it's an empty room with some benches in it, right? And if you walk into the, um, the sanctuary at Sacred Heart, on a Tuesday afternoon. There are probably people sitting in there praying and there are candles burning and, and you, have to, you have to enter the space in a certain way, right? You have to make the sign of the cross or do the thing with holy water or you know, there are practices for entering because you're going into sacred space. Um, so the good thing about the way that the Protestant uh, tradition has kind of desacralized space um, is that we're bearing witness to a truth that God is everywhere, not just in this spot. That's a truth. We bear witness to that. The problem with that is that if you don't mark off a space where you say, I'm going to specifically see God in this space, then pretty soon you quit seeing God in other spaces too. Um, uh, there are similar, there's a similar uh, shift uh, in talking about time and people and certainly in talking about the Eucharist. Um, so we talked a little bit last week about the liturgical enchantment of time, the way that the, the calendar kind of tells you, um, tells you what time it is in a sacred way rather than just, oh, it's, it's April 12th, whatever, whatever significance that date has, right? 
Um, but no, it's the Monday after the second Sunday of Easter, and that matters. Um, or the, the relationship to saints, the idea that, um, you know, the Protestant idea is that saints are not just specific individual figures that we lift up and say, this one's perfect. Uh, but really, saints are every Christian, the way that Paul wrote his letters to the saints in Corinth, of all places. Um, and uh, so this idea that everyone has the ability to be a saint, that and being a saint is something God just does, and you just count. And, but that means that we stop looking through individual people to see God, to see what Christian life looks like. Um, or you can see it uh, really clearly in, in our sacrament of the Lord's Supper as compared to the, the Eucharist um, in, in Catholic understanding where, you know, bread and wine get actually turned into the body and, and blood of Jesus. And in particularly the more radical Protestant traditions, the bread and the grape juice get sort of set aside as a, a reminder like it's a little memory aid for us. Um, the, and our Calvinist tradition tries to kind of have our cake and eat it too. Um, so we say Jesus is really spiritually present with us, but we don't know how that works. But we're pretty sure it's bread and juice. Um, so, so we've got this pulling apart of the, the material world and the spiritual world. Um, as opposed to them being really shot through with each other. Um, and so ultimately, Protestantism has been a journey from the mystical to the moral. So from the mystical, from this, this experiential engagement with God to the moral, we know how to be good people. So, you know, ever since Calvin, you know, became the pastor of Geneva, Switzerland, you know, kind of the line has been, you know, what is it? I don't drink, dance, or chew, or go with girls who do. <clears throat> you know, um, what what Christians are supposed to do? We're supposed to, you know, keep our mouths clean and, you know, don't use drugs and don't smoke and don't have sex before marriage, right? Um, and and maybe, you know, do some works of charity and social justice, right? Not because that'll get you into heaven, but because you're supposed to do that. This is what Jesus taught us to do, right? Um, the problem is that you don't actually need God to talk about ethics. You don't actually need God to talk about what it means to be a good person. And so let's set God aside and move on, um, or let's talk about what it means to be a good person and read a story from the Bible and not, you know, maybe those overlap with each other slightly, but we're not really talking about what an experience of God is. So the problem with all of this is that there's a hole in us. Uh, there's a, a God-shaped hole in our psyches. Um, so Richard Beck is a psychologist. He studies minds and emotions. And so we have this, you know, we have this sort of, oh, our brain and our heart and, and you know, our, we think up here and we feel down here. And he says, you know, contemporary science has actually finally caught up with the ancient Greeks in understanding that your, your brain and your emotions are the same thing. Uh, that your, your reason and your emotions really are doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing in different modes, right? Um, but uh, so we're going to talk about the psyche uh, as kind of this integrated place uh, where our, our mind and our, our emotion happen. So um, uh, Richard was playing golf with his dad and his dad said, you know, the, the problem is that, you know, this younger generation just doesn't, doesn't desire God anymore. And Richard said, you know, I actually think they do desire God. Young people do desire God. He works with young people all the time as a college professor. He says, I think they do desire God. They just don't know it. They call that desire anxiety or depression or loneliness. But everywhere you look, you can see that desire for God. But the only language young people have for God is the language of mental illness. 
So when they say anxiety or depression in those kind of non-clinical senses in which we use those, really what we're talking about is a desire for God. Um, now, he's a psychologist. He knows psychology. He knows that severe mental illness is also a thing and that that is not just a matter of, of sort of religious longing. And he knows that those are illnesses that need real treatment. But the way that we overuse that language of mental illness, he says, um, that is actually pointing to this ache that is in us. He says, the ache is our disenchantment with disenchantment. We know that something needs to be there and we just don't know what it is. So, um, so we have this sense that there needs to be something more, um, even if we don't have language for it. We need a purpose beyond ourselves. And so uh, that purpose beyond ourselves, that's actually a matter of enchantment. That's a matter of, of seeing God present in the world around us. Psychologists actually have a way of measuring this now. They have a variable called mattering. So that goes along with other variables in psychology, you know, neuroticism and self-esteem and this and this and this, but mattering actually is the, this conviction that you matter that your life has cosmic significance regardless of what's going on around you. Um, so he talks about uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, who was a Holocaust survivor and psychologist. And he wrote about uh, what he learned at Auschwitz. And one of the things he learned at Auschwitz was that those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. You have a reason to live. You can put up with how life happens. Um, but meaning, if it's just grounded in my own experience, that's really vulnerable and shaky. Because life can take away the things that give us meaning. If the thing that gives me meaning is my job or my relationship with my spouse or my physical health or my mental health, those can all get taken away. And even if... I have this sense that I matter because I matter to myself. Um, even that sort of that self-esteem kind of mattering, that's trouble too, because we are really good at deceiving ourselves. Um, that may be the most Calvinist thing I can say. We are really good at deceiving ourselves. Um, so we can convince ourselves that we matter, or we can convince ourselves that we're fine, or we can convince ourselves that we're trash but if we're looking for our meaning within ourselves, we're not gonna find it. Um, and even if we do find it, tomorrow we will have lost it again because we keep changing. So this is why mattering, meaning, is a matter of enchantment. This is why this, this ache that we have inherited as heirs of the Protestant Reformation and the scientific revolution um, in our ways of thinking where all the spiritual stuff is out there and kind of floofy and doesn't really matter, but what's, what matters is right here. Um, we are still looking for that purpose because that purpose is an out there. It's an eccentric thing centered outside ourselves. And if the, if our purpose is outside ourselves, then our orientation turns from within myself to out there, out to where the world really is, where God really is. Um, and so that's, that's how this stuff that we have inherited about, oh, the, you know, the world is kind of separate from God, um, has actually left us really longing for where God is. So that's two very quick chapters thrown at you very fast. Um, you have more reading you can do if you wanna, if you wanna dig deeper into there, but I wanna give you a moment to chew and swallow. So I'll give us just a minute of silence here. Notice what you heard that interested you. Note any questions that may have come up for you. You are welcome to uh, jot those down if that's helpful.
All right, I'm going to throw a little bit more at you, but I'm going to do it contemplatively. How about that? Um, so I want to talk about contemplation uh, as our mode of enchantment uh, for this week. Uh, so as I said last week, we've got these four different modes of enchantment, and rather than try to create a week where we just talk about enchantment in these four different ways, we're going to spread that material out so that you get to uh, really kind of dig into some of these. So we're going to talk about contemplative enchantment. And uh, the idea of contemplative enchantment is to really bring us to where God is in the moment. So uh, in the way that, say, liturgical enchantment is a very sort of broad sweep of time kind of thing, uh, contemplative enchantment is really about noticing that God is right here, right now. That even as we are all sitting in front of these screens, God mm -hmm. is with us and God is in each one of these little boxes that we have lived our lives in for 14 months. Um, so uh, chapter seven begins with the story of Nicholas, who was a 17th century French monastic, uh, better known as Brother Lawrence. And Brother Lawrence had this amazing capacity for worship in the, the lowliest of things. So he said, the, the time of business, the time of work, does not with me differ from the time of prayer. In the noise and clutter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were on my knees at the Blessed Supper. And Brother Lawrence's insights were eventually published uh, in a book titled The Practice of the Presence of God. The Practice of the Presence of God. And that's this classic of the contemplative tradition. He's not like the first contemplative. There, uh, there's a contemplative tradition all the way back um, through the beginning of Christianity, all the way back uh, deep into the, the tradition that would come to be known as Judaism that we also kind of branched out from. Um, but uh, Brother Lawrence just had this capacity for knowing that he was in God's presence and, and being attentive to God's presence in the middle of a monastery kitchen, you know, where there's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, and monks are not always nice to each other. So uh, Brother Lawrence, you know, his, his bliss is not an easy bliss. You know, he's not just, oh, everything's, you know, rainbows and puppies. Um, he had to work at this. And so his, his awareness, any awareness of God's presence is effortful and practiced. And so the contemplative tradition uh, points us not only to, hey, did you notice where God is, but really uh, intentional spiritual disciplines, practices. Uh, because just like disenchantment has been this, this habituated way of thinking that we think about, oh, you know, we think about this watch over here, you know, and then one hour out of every 168, we spend over here thinking about the watchmaker, and then we come back to the watch and take care of that again. Um, so that's a habit, right? Um, uh, enchantment is also a habit. It's a habit of being attentive to, if we're going to stay in that stupid metaphor, and paying attention to the watchmaker while you're down in the gears of the watch. It's a bad metaphor. Quit using that. Um, so Brother Lawrence came to us uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition, and in the 17th century, there was very clearly a Roman Catholic tradition and a uh, set of Protestant traditions. Uh, Brother Lawrence uh, was a Carmelite, so um, he's like super Catholic. Um, uh, also super Catholic is St. Ignatius. Uh, so that was the prayer of examine uh, that we did at the beginning of class. Um, and the, the idea with the examine is an assessment of the day. Um, examine is, um, it's the Spanish word for test, uh, just like you would, you know, you would give your students a test. And why do you give your students a test? In order to find out whether they are good enough to get into heaven, right? No, 
You give your students a test so you can find out what they still need to learn, right? You give your students a test to find out what they still need to learn. So you give yourself this test or you give yourself this test uh, with the support of a spiritual director. So this one-on-one -on -one spiritual direction relationship kind of grows uh, to us out of this Ignatian tradition as well. Um, and what you're looking at as you assess your day is what are those situations of consolation and those situations of desolation? Uh, consolation is um, when you're noticing, a, and you can see this more clearly in retrospect, you're noticing when you were really in line with God's movement, you were really connected to what God is doing. And our emotions are a good compass uh, for that kind of thing, um, especially when you've got kind of the, the eye of context. So, and so it's not just, oh, did I feel good? Did I feel bad? But, but deep within me, was I, you know, was I recognizing that I'm connected with God or was I feeling really disconnected from God? Uh, during that time. And what you do, uh, this one examine that we've done this evening is uh, by itself pretty useless. But if you do this over and over again, what you start to notice is patterns. And you start to recognize, well, what are some of the places or people or times or activities when I really am connected with God, those times of consolation? And what are those times that I am just routinely disconnected, those times of, of consistent desolation? Um, and what you start to notice is, hey, maybe there's a habit that I'm engaging in that I don't even realize I'm engaging in. But now that I see the pattern over time, I can say, I could do this differently. I could engage this situation differently. I could respond to this person differently. I could shape my morning differently. Um, and so that's what, the, that's what that examine as a contemplative practice uh, really sort of invites us into. And notice how that kind of enchants, for instance, that shift toward the, the ethical, right? Um, you know, from, from the mystical to the moral, you know, are you, am I being a good person? Well, for, for Ignatius, the question is not, really, am I being a good person? The question is, am I living as God is leading me to live? And so it's a discernment question. Um, and so you care about how your actions affect other people, but you care in God's light rather than just, well, you know, what are the, what are the compromises I can make here or need to make here? What'll be fine, right? So those are, um, those are a couple of of big sort of modes of, of, enchant of contemplative enchantment coming at us from the, um, from the Catholic tradition. Um, Richard Beck also uses um, tangible objects and his are based in the Orthodox tradition. Um, uh, he uses prayer rope and prayer beads. Um, it's a slightly different prayer than for instance, the rosary, which is its own, uh, that's a Roman Catholic uh, set of prayer beads. Um, but he's got a, a set of prayer beads in his pocket and a prayer rope around his wrist. And uh, these beads are numbered off um, either 33 or 100 or, five, or 150. Some of them go even farther than that. Um, and the prayer is, um, it's called the Jesus prayer. Um, and it's, it's an ancient Christian prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Just over and over and over. Um, and that just, you know, you use the beads just so that you remember to do it multiple times, right? Um, and the, the numbers, you know, the 33 uh, beads on sort of the starter set, um, you know, 33 beads for 33 years in Jesus' life. Um, uh, the other numbers are just bigger. Um, or you can have a, a single word like breath prayer, um, just like mercy or peace. And what you're doing is you're, you're centering yourself on that attention to God in that particular set of words. Um, 
And so those words kind of just become a lens that God is going to shine through for you. Um, there are also some, uh, some other sort of structures and supports uh, that support uh, this contemplative enchantment. So liturgical prayer actually is a big support for this. Um, not because the liturgy is particularly contemplative, but because it, it structures out this time in which uh, you start to notice a little bit more. Contemplation is about noticing. Um, there are also uh, some nonverbal disciplines. So fasting or Sabbath keeping or scripture reading, um, intentional simplicity. So deciding to to have less, not only stuff, but commitments in life. Um, practices of silence. Uh, so Brother Lawrence uh, would bring us back to silence um, and just spending empty time with your attention on God so that you can have your attention on God while you're chopping potatoes. Um, practicing with a group can help with these contemplative enchantments. Um, but the purpose is never just the practice. The practice is there to support this encounter with God. Um, so you're not looking for ideas or knowledge. You're looking for this relationship, this awareness of God's love in everything around you. So that's your very quick sketch of contemplative enchantments. We will come back and talk about not just those contemplative enchantments, but also how those kind of re-enliven that God who maybe isn't dead after all, right? We've just been looking the other direction. So take another minute here. Um, again, notice what you heard that interested you. Notice what questions have come up for you, and then we will come right back. So when you are ready, what did you notice? What are you wondering about? What do you want to pick at just a little bit? You can certainly pick. I kept so a lot of younger people losing God is because our world is faster paced and we tend not to focus or find the traditional things that we do. Um, for a while, everybody had a gratitude journal, but that would be a contemplative thing where you stopped at the end of the day and thought about how you moved through the day, how God was a part of that. And we've kind of lost that because everything's coming at us so quickly. Yeah, busyness is a huge enemy of contemplative practice yeah. because it takes time. It really deliberately takes time. So I would say too, um, there is a really clear hunger for contemplative practice. So, you know, uh, people who no longer, you know, no longer believe in God or believe in some spiritual thing, but not that stuff that the church taught me because the church never showed me the stuff they were teaching me, um, you know, but, but I have this amazing yoga practice or, you know, I, 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 I practice meditation for an hour and a half every day or so there's this, there's this desire for contemplative practice and people who are willing to carve out time for contemplative practice. Um, but yes, uh, busyness is 
poison for contemplative practice. And in the Muslim faith, they pray five times a day. So it's built into their day. Yeah, so that, which moment would praying five times a day be? It would keep you That focused. would be a liturgical enchantment. Yeah, and, um, yeah. and yeah, so part of the, you know, um, if you if you pray five times a day and um, and the the monastics say the same thing, people who practice that that full schedule of daily prayers, um, Christian monastics will say the same thing that they say you're always either coming from prayer or going to prayer. And so so the times you know the times of the day that are not built around prayer are very, very small. Um, and they're so small that they're built around prayer too. Yeah. And uh, Joan Chittister, who's a, a Benedictine, um, said that the, the purpose of liturgical prayer is so that you can pray the rest of the time too. Yeah, I'm just going to use that money. So, uh, Bev, you were going to try to get in there too. Bruce was going to get in there. Yes. I kept uh, thinking about how busy we are in our work or in our pursuit of uh, uh, going, going to work. And I kept thinking about uh, being a teacher where it's like being in a snowball fight. They're, they're, they're constantly throwing snowballs at you and you, you don't have time to duck or think or pray or you know whatever. It's, it's just uh, something in our society keeps us so busy that we don't make time, or don't have time to pray five times a day, let alone one or two or three times a day. What is it in our society that keeps us so doggone busy that we can't take that time? The idea that it's all about us. The idea that it's all about us. Okay. And how does that keep us so doggone busy? We don't need to think about anything other than ourselves. Our busyness is the solution to I don't know what, but there's something in the catechism that I can't bring the phrase to mind, but one or two of you at least will probably know it, that the, the chief end of man is to, somebody fill in the blank, please. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Thank you. That's what I was trying to think of. Um, and that seems to me to be the opposite of God putting us here with any kind of discretion about what we do. And I don't over, I'm, I'm not into Calvinism or not Calvinism, but if we're thinking about only praying five times a day or only feeling God while we're in church, then the rest of the time we must not need him now maybe that's partly your point but i don't i'm not getting the same feeling from the author that you are i don't think nathan okay so what are you getting from the author i'm this is part of why we read books together yes i i don't know i just read through that and went it doesn't grokking. Anybody know the word grokking? Sorry. I'm, yeah, you. Yeah, if you're a sci-fi nut, you might know the word. But I apologize for using it because I'm not going to try to explain it. Is that um, like does not compute, John? Yeah, pretty much. And similar. Mm, I would have said it differently. Emotional. I would. I would think of something grokking being more an innate part of you which might come yeah. out the same place that you said, Bev, but that isn't the way I would have put it. Okay, okay. 
Yeah, I'm I'm having a lot of trouble with this stuff. I'm trying to think through it and make one comment that I thought might make some difference, but I'm not very sure of where I'm going or why I'm going there. That is okay too. We are allowed to wander a little bit with this. Well, and I think interpretations are as unique as each of us are. So hopefully the message is there. We're all catching on to that, but we will apply it to our own life and thus everyone is different. And I think we respect that part, right? I would hope we do, yeah. Yeah, and I think we take it as to how it affects our life at this point in time with what we have and, you know, I think it's, our lives are so unique. But I Maybe like, so. yeah, go ahead, when we get to retirement, yeah. it's all about making choices. With what do you do when you get up in the morning? And some of us are better at doing that than others. My retirement came through disability, so I'm a good 10 years ahead of myself, but it took a number of years to figure out what physically I was capable of doing, where I could volunteer, how I could fill my days. And I would have said depression was a big part of it initially as well. I didn't want to give up my career, and suddenly I had to give up my career in a moment's notice, you know, and, and then I couldn't go back. And that was really tough but I could have removed myself from God or I could choose to find God and figure out where God fits into that new kind of life without the busyness. And it's all about choices. And if you choose to be contemplative and you put God in the center of that, then you're going to be a believer. It strikes me with what you said, Deb, that that illustrates what I'm thinking but not saying very well, that you were speaking of your career as something you choose. And when your career was over, that it was your choice what to do about that next. I think maybe more that your career is to do certain things, not eight to five or for a paycheck, but your career is to do certain things with your life. Um, maybe that's a little more Buddhist. I'm not sure what that is. But if you're not... John, but, I think the word you're looking for is vocation. Oh, that, that, I could use that word in the sentence, but I'm, that is, that's kind of what it's not about. Um, okay. My, I, I, most of you know that my dad died when I was 10. So I, it's surprising that I have much recollection of him or what he was about, but I do because he was a very strong, interesting person. And I've always had the feeling that he thought what he was doing at a given moment had less to do with him and more to do with God's purpose. But he wasn't one to say, I'm going to go around praying all the time. I think I said to somebody recently that... Well, I know I did, but it wasn't to this group. That, to, in a sense, what you're doing is the prayer, the, the paying attention to God. Now, maybe I'm all off on my definition of prayer, but that's kind of mine. So my dad, for example, um, well, after his 20s, when he tried two or three different things, and of course, I wasn't born yet. He made what he did all about stewardship of the land and stewardship of the resources that God gave us. He was thinking about that as a farmer before almost anybody else was. If anybody's familiar with the, the teachings of Dr. Wallace at ISU, uh, that's another, that would be an example of it, but I, my dad was sort of a devotee of him and uh, 
that meant that if he was milking the cows, it, he wouldn't sit there and say, I'm doing this for the glory of God. But he would just think of it that way. That would be what he's doing. And everything he was doing would be about that. Now, I've never understood the idea of monks chanting for 16 hours a day or any of the examples you laid on us. To me, it's different from, again, I, it's hard, I can't figure out how to say it, but it's different from what the author is trying to say. Well, John, it sounds like what you're describing is the, the same posture that Brother Lawrence brought yes, into yes. his daily tasks. And, and so he's a monastic. He's living under the rule. He's no longer living, um, except right. in glory. But um, he's, he was living under the rule of St. Benedict, which is very structured, tons of prayer. But every moment you're not praying, you're working. And so, and then Brother Lawrence said, well, every moment I am working, I'm also praying. And I so, think that would be true as far as you said that sentence. But the idea that somebody has to work in a structure is exactly wrong. I, uh, when I quit practicing law, it was largely because I was just tired of it. Didn't hate it. I was just tired of it. It wasn't giving me what I needed. And maybe I'm going back a little bit to what Deb said. I could find other things to do where I would, if I say get more out of it, I'm making it about me, but I could get more out of it and work to the glory of God. If that's the, if that's the expression. Yeah. So the, uh, I, so, I don't, so the, the question, yeah. um, so th I mean, the question I would probably ask um, both John and Deb, because you've both talked about your retirements and, um, and finding what meaning, right? Um, mm -hmm. finding yeah. purpose in those, in those retirements. Um, the, the question I'll ask is how do you, how do you decide you, you get up every morning and you get to decide what to do. And, and, and at first, um, Deb, you described that as, as coming with a, a depression, right? This loss mm -hmm. of purpose, because, you know, nobody provides purpose like a classroom full of kids, right? Cause you, as Bruce right. said, you take a moment without knowing what you're doing and where you're going, then they're on you, right? Um, but, uh, but having to decide what you're gonna do with that day. And you had to, you, you, found, a, you found a way to live in that reality that, oh, you know, today's Monday. I have to decide what to do on Monday. Um, so the question is gonna be, how do you decide? Um, John, I do want to acknowledge, um, I'm not meaning to say that you need, that you, the, the universal global you, needs a liturgical structure for your day in order to, uh, in order to milk the cows to the glory of God. Um, there, there are lots of different, even practices within this, this set of contemplative enchantments. Um, lots of different take, practices that make that happen. I didn't take you to be saying that. I thought you were more saying that is one way to get there. Yeah, it is a it is a support that many folks have found have found meaningful it, from the perspective of helping them be in that that posture with God throughout the day. So. So yeah, don't don't ever feel like there's only one way to do this cuz we're getting we're getting four different modes and and a bunch of different practices within each mode. I've the discernment many question times. is how do you decide what to do on day 973 of retirement? I don't think when I get out of the out of bed in the morning of what I have to do to be religious enough or pure, pure enough or good enough. That just isn't the way my brain works. But I do feel if I'm doing something, it better be for some useful purpose. I have explained to many of my friends who says, you're a pres you know, when they say, you're a Presbyterian, what's that? I usually emphasize the 
fact that God seems to have given us choices. He doesn't seem to, to me, to want us to um, go around chanting all day. And that we're just, maybe it's like the uh, one or more of the parables. We're just responsible to report at the end of the day that we made things better. And I don't know what, what the name of that theory is, but that's a little bit of what I think. All of this I am finding. Every discussion that has happened in the last 15 minutes, it's about purpose. And every time somebody is talking about purpose and what do we do, the word fulfillment fills me. And that is something that we look for something because we are a group of people who think similarly as far as enchantment and, and faith that we want to fulfill not us, but I think others. And it isn't a purpose. A purpose brings boundaries and rules and all that, like the monastery, you know, a cloistered monastery. Can you imagine? They don't even talk. Or the cloistered nunneries. It's like, really? But I hear they make great brandy. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, and the ones in Dubuque will make a casket for you. Yes, that's right. That's Isn't that right. great. Yeah. So, um, so okay. So you. So yeah. So talking about fulfillment, filled with what? If I'm stuck on a desert island with a beach ball, in the <laughs> movie we all know, fulfillment for me might just be living through the day and hoping I see a rescue ship tomorrow that might be fulfilling enough uh or it might not but it might fill you that with is what? one say again what might it fill you with the feeling that i had going back to what bev was saying done my purpose my bur my purpose may simply to be to stay alive and save myself for better things some other day i'm making that up but that's the short answer to the question you asked uh, I don't think I have to build a cathedral on the island while I'm there. I don't think I have to uh, say the rosary a thousand times a day. That if God, if that's where God put me, then he must figure that I can fulfill my purpose by being there. And I'm not saying that well at all, but that's kind of where I'm going. I think God gave us the brains and the heart to figure it out. Yeah. So I'm interested in something and I, I want to be really clear. This is not like a, this is not like a, an accusation, but I'm noticing um, in uh, both Bev and John, the way that you just described those things, um, uh, a thing that, uh, that I have heard described as Christian atheism. And oh. let me let me say what I mean by that. Um, so so Bev, you said, I like to think God gave me the brains and the heart to figure that out. God gave me, Bev, the brains and the heart to figure that out. Everybody has it. So well, sure, sure, everybody. But 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 Bev in particular because you're the one stuck on the desert island, right? No, John. Um, is. Well, John is. I don't know what what your <laughs> island is, well, what, what has, climate your desert has. But yes, Wilson with him. That's right. Yeah, so, um, but this, I have the brains and the heart to figure this out. So who's doing the figuring out there is Bev. For and fulfillment. Just in, the, just in the, or yeah, who's, who's being fulfilled in that moment is Bev. So just, I, I'm just calling attention to, to the, the, no, no, the language right. there. Right. Um, so John, I'm actually hearing something very similar in, um, in the way that you were describing, you know, I got from the beginning of the day to the end of the day and I didn't pop my beach ball and, um, and, you know, I survived that day. I feel like I've done my job. Who's doing the job? John's doing the job. John is. 
Well, there's no one else. I, on. There's nobody but else I'm on the it. island, right? But that's kind of the point, actually. <clears throat> there's nobody else on the island. Yes, there is. Well, there's there's a beach ball with some Sharpie on it. But other than no, that, no, 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 no. But but what I'm saying is, in the in the language that we're using there, we're actually not talking about God. I yes, am. I am. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying it well, and maybe I'm not doing, <laughs> doing it well, but on the island, maybe there's a beach ball, maybe there's me, maybe there's uh, gorillas, I don't know, but I, in my <laughs> example, where I'm on that island with God, which is the same reason I don't need to go in a church building yeah. or stay away from a church building, as some people would. Right. I just that it you use the word purpose and I'll use your purpose uh, uh, your your word I'm sorry fulfillment. that we fulfillment well okay I, I I was thinking you said purpose but maybe it was fulfillment too I feel like I have a purpose and my job is not it's not about me we're back to the catechism to live for the greater glory of God or whatever that is I. <laughs> If I knew where that took me, I wouldn't be sitting here on a Monday night when the Cubs are on trying to figure this out. I, I must not know the answer very well, but that's the way I think about it. So I think that um, one of the things that, uh, that we may just want to be attentive to is the way that our language does or doesn't remember that this is to the glory of God. And I think, I, John, your point is well taken that, um, that the, the point of this is not to all of us, you know, march around chanting all day or um, to, you know, to build cathedrals because that's the only place that, that we could imagine God being that you know, one of the gifts of the, the Protestant tradition actually is the, the Protestant doctrine of vocation. Um, and we don't have, uh, we don't have monastic orders in the, in the Protestant traditions because every household is to be its own monastery. Every job is to be its own, its own part of the way that we together bring glory to God through the work that we do in part by serving one another and by tending this, this world that is also sacred. Right. Um, so, so there's a lot there and um, we have this tendency and I do this too. I'm, I'm, I was only grabbing John and Bev's language because I, I heard it just sort of echoing right one after the other but this, I have to do X, Y, and Z, you know, I, you know, um, on, on Friday, you know, when, when Ian gets done with school, you know, um, he'll find me and say, have you written your sermon yet? <laughs> right? <laughs> because he knows that that piece of this job, this vocation, that is the big obstacle between me and spending time with him over the weekend right um and so he's he's attentive to that right but but i got to that's a big obstacle between me and spending time with him over the weekend because it's my sermon that i have to write it's my job it's my work to do none of that is theologically true theologically my role in this whole sermon writing enterprise is to <clears throat> be open enough to hear what God is saying to y'all through whatever words happen to process through my neurons and my fingers and ultimately my mouth. Most of the best sermons I've ever heard have either been implicitly or, no, that's not the word, either been clearly and admittedly, or at least the way the person was talking, delivered by throwing away the notes, even maybe the mental notes, 
So don't be afraid to get up and tell us what you think sometime in case in case you're, you, you've been at this job as a Presbyterian so long that you think you've got to time your sermon out to be between 12 and 20 minutes and it has to mention it has to have three points. That's what I learned about sermons from a, fr- a minister friend. It's got it's got a time out so people don't go to sleep and it has to have three points. Start with with a um, with a verse and end with amen. That's, and that's right. And so the point is that it's possible to reduce the thing that looks like a sermon to that, right? It's this very dry, structured thing that you just, I do. It's my job, right? Um, And John's exactly right that the good ones aren't from me. And I'm not saying that to to demean myself, right? Um, I'm saying that because any this is this is theologically true any good that comes of my work in putting a sermon together is god's doing that is good solid reformed theology right there um including any work that you do to understand what i say any, any inkling of understanding that you get out of a sermon that I happen to say with or without the assistance of my words, any understanding you get from that is God's work through the Holy Spirit in you as we do this together. You're le- oh, I finish your point. Which I, is to say that this whole thing, and we're not just talking about sermons here, right? We're also talking about pails of milk and legal briefs Patience. and classrooms right. full of, fi- of fifth graders, right? Um, right? You know, every one of those things, any value that comes out of that is God's doing. That's what Brother Lawrence is trying to clue us into. That's what Ignatius is trying to get us to notice. That's, that's what, and not because we don't matter, right? We actually matter more in that because we're about God's work in that moment. Mm-hmm. And this enchantment is about, um, this, this process of enchantment is about having that actually be a thing that happens in our experiential world. And our language gives us a way. You know, my language gives me a way when I am really grumbling and struggling and crabbing about a sermon that I'm working so hard on. Um, because it, that's my language is then telling you that I'm trying to do it without allowing God to do it through me. Right. I'm thinking of a bad analogy. That's the that best kind. Being, hmm? Bad analogies I, are the best kind. Okay. Uh, the uh, coach will say, for example, Take that bat and get out there in the box and don't think about what pitch is coming. Have fun with it. Now, I don't really follow the logic of that totally, except that he's saying, don't get too involved in yourself. And that's what it means to me. And Rev is shaking her head, but that's okay. Um, The place I'm trying to tie this together a little bit with the author is that it seems to me that people who are not enchanted anymore are not paying attention. And when you say, how can busyness take us away from God? We're not paying attention. Now, maybe it's easier for me to say, oh yeah, God's over there in that chair in the corner, whether I see him or not. Or as a friend of mine occasionally says, how do you know it isn't her? I don't know. I'm just a top adopting the language in the book. But I can, I can feel that. But other people have to go to church to feel the presence of God or have a set of rosary beads in their hand or say, oh, it's noon or what time, whatever time it is. I've got to pray now. Uh, I just, I don't even understand that kind of thinking. But I'm back to saying it feels to me like people who are not religious are not paying attention. I also have a whole bunch of questions to ask the people at Pew Research about what they think that being Christian or religious is. 
and if they're asking somebody, are you religious? The Pew I people are pretty good about letting people just decide for themselves what they think about it. The Barna people will tell you what they think it means to be religious. The who? But the Pew people will ask you, you know, they ask people, you know, religiously, how do you identify? And they're the ones who discovered people, you know, that what, 26% of the total population um, has no interest in calling themselves religious. Those but are that categories too, that don't even click for them. I, I draw the line at whether they are spiritual. I know any number, and you, you we can put fine points on it. Let's but let's find just you on the, the language. Let's find you the the Pew study because they're they're good rigorous social scientists. Um, so you can you can find their language and and pick that apart. Bev. How many were in their audience? What's the size of what, their what survey? What were the questions? How many Okay, questions? Bev, we'll find you the, the research survey too, and you can... <laughs> Being a director of marketing, that's the first thing you ask is, who did that's you talk right. to? Yeah. Were they 10-year-olds? What ages were how they? Many? Who is one I, of the big players in how this? Many? So they, they've done their work. I take for granted okay. that if Pew puts out a survey, they are academically rigorous and they've talked to an awful lot of people and they've done an awful lot of thinking about the wording okay. now that doesn't mean they can't screw up I was this say, isn't a matter of asking three people at the bus stop and then bus stop and then writing a paper i know it isn't that coming around right. the back side right so that <laughs> so was going to do more social science what do you need a Deb? few a few years ago, we read a book, and I don't even remember the name of it, but it was about whispers from God. Anybody remember that? Whispers. It had the word whispers in the title. Anyway, basically, what we learned was God's always there, and God is always in us and around us and over us and under us and next to us. But unless you're open to hearing that message and direction and contemplation, you're not going to hear it. You have to be open to it. Maybe that's and what so, I mean by not paying attention. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I think that exactly. is, yeah. And I think, yeah. um, I think Beck would identify enchantment really as a matter of attention. Okay. It's not a matter of, do we think God is there? It's a matter of, are we, are we noticing that God is there? You're not going to so, see John, I think wall. you're right on it. Yeah. You're not going to see the gorilla. Yeah, in the introduction, he used the example of that that video um, that you may have seen go. It spreads through the internet every now and again, but um, it says, "Okay, you know, here's these two basketball teams, and your job is to watch and see oh, how many the times camera. the basketball teams pass the basketball in this uh, one minute." And it you do that, and it gets to the end of the minute, and it says. Now, the correct answer was 26 or something. Now, did you notice the dancing gorilla? And it <laughs> rewinds and it shows you the same video again. And right in the middle of the whole thing, there's this person in a gorilla suit dancing through the screen. And you, you don't, don't even it. notice because your attention right. is on the basketball, right? Right. right? You just don't even see this other thing that is already happening. And so the... The, the preacher move here, right? This is, this is his move. I didn't make this move. Um, the preacher move is, you know, God is, or attention to God is as if you were noticing that dancing gorilla when everything around you is saying, watch the basketball and don't see anything else. And if we watch the basketball and don't see anything else, or if we, if we sort of live in this, this sort of Protestant scientific Western Euro-American mode where every day the thing that matters is that I get up and do something. Um, I get up and do my job. That's what's most important for the big middle chunk of your life, right? I get up and do my job um, and then I retire. And like, what's a successful retirement, right? Like, man, I've got to like, I've got to drink the right coffee and I've got to, I've got to, you know, I've got to go golfing on such and such a days. And, and pretty soon, you know, the people who they retire and they're like, I'm busier than I ever thought I was when I was working. And I, I yeah. don't know how I ever had time to have a job. And, and, and what has happened there is that 
all of that busyness that was the work life got replaced with new busyness in retirement. And then along comes COVID. Yeah, along comes COVID or you have to retire for disability rather than just because you had enough Battle. nest egg and you were ready to quit. Yeah. And, and you go through that process of, I don't get to fill my time with all this doing. I have to, or I don't get to fill my time with stuff, right? Um, what do I do? Right. What am I worth? What am I worth? Well, what I'm worth is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You know, that what is the chief end of man? End is purpose. You know, what, what is humanity here for? This is, um, this is the um, wow. Westminster Catechism. Um, what is humanity here for? Humanity is here to glorify God and abide in God's presence forever. We have no other purpose. Everything else we do is either an expression of that or it is not an expression of that. And the discernment question is, what are the things I shall do today that are expressions of that? Or how in this moment can I recognize what is giving glory to God and abiding in God's presence? To me, short version, uh, my purpose of a day is to I said, do useful things, and that probably isn't the right word, but to at least not screw up what, what God's trying to do. And that, that's, what the, that's what those times of desolation uh, in, the, in the examine are about, is noticing, when did I screw up? And I don't, you know, I'm, I may have thought I was not screwing up at the time, but it turned out that I was screwing up. And so you're recognizing that. And again, this is a long, slow process. Uh, none of these are good quick fixes. Well, it seems like we're always looking for direction. I mean, if I don't know what to do next, you know, I, I find myself saying, you know, now what, God? But I mean, it, it seems like he's always there sort of unconsciously. <laughs> but anyway, well, depending on him to help give you direction, then that gives you a purpose. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but yeah. And those that practice of coming back to okay, what now, God? Yeah, that's that is actually that's a contemplative practice. I hate to quote a Cubs manager as speaking for God, but he was. You know where I'm going with this already? No, I'm just thinking oh, okay. about I how awful were, God's track record was no, for most of the 20th uh, century. The Cubs, the previous <laughs> Cubs manager. Right. Always, he, he said the job of the players don't suck. <laughs> Which one was that, John? Oh, what, what was his name, Tammy? Well, he was the previous manager two, three years ago. Oh. But he he what? even he, uh, he had the Madden? shirt. What? Madden? Madden? No. No. Close Madden. to that. Madden's for that. Two words sounds like. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, guy that um, put the dirt around the bases in order for him to win. He was from New Orleans. What that was sounds name? like something he'd do, but I'm not yeah. aware of that. But no, he's the guy. He he uh, he took the guy that took the kid, the Cubs to the World Series, and he didn't seem to take the whole thing or himself all that seriously. You know, you'll what to you'll know what to do, or it'll happen, no matter what you think you're supposed to be doing. Don't take it too seriously. Go out there and have fun. Don't suck. Joe Madden. Oh, Joe Tammy Madden. says Joe Madden. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. she, she's actually been doing other things this whole time. So that's, uh, so I haven't put her on, but I guess she gets to hear what I say. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for whoever, yeah, Joe Madden. Uh, and I, that, that's not quite the way I envision God, but I, there's a little bit of wisdom in there. Yeah, there is. <laughs> there is some wisdom in there. And the, again, the contemplative piece of that, I think, John, you were on that with, um, with the, the batting coach's advice. Mm -hmm. You know, quit trying, to, quit trying to have the perfect swing for the perfect pitch and just go out there and have fun. If you're, if you're having fun, I mean, human beings are like... Huge we're like the only species who plays our entire life, like human beings and dogs that we domesticated. Um, 
And, and the more social a species is, the more time they'll spend playing. So don't look at the primates because they're close to us. Um, but um, but the, the way that we play throughout our lives, what we're doing, what play does is it brings you into the moment, brings you really attentively into here's where I am and what is going on around me. And it turns out that one of the things going on around me is God. Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that, again, it's, it's like play as a mode of enchantment. That's, that's its own whole subset of theology for me. Um, but it's a, um, but it is, it really is contemplative in that way. And, you know, you have this thing that you're doing and you're doing it with the awareness maybe of, you know, the whole team is, you know, the whole team is winning and we're all working together and this is great, right? Like you, um, you know, a good infielder has to know at all times where all the other infielders are, whether they realize that they know that or not. Um, so, you know, which is not to say that your average second baseman is God, but some of them are, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um but it is that that same uh that same level of attentive presence that we would want to bring to god right and so there's a whole lot to be said for for playfulness in the life of prayer in the life of of saying yeah i can see where god is and or i can i can guess at where god is right like i don't have to get it right i can just i can just take a stab at where God is, and that's actually good enough. Y'all, we're going to talk about, book. this is a fun book. I enjoy this. Um, John, you are right on with, this is a matter of attention, um, that enchantment is a matter of attention. Um, and so today we have gone through this 500 years in which we have not attended to God as a present reality in the world in which we uh, spend our lives. Um, we're going to become eccentric next week. Mm. <laughs> John's ready. <laughs> it's like, I'm halfway there already. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to become an eccentric next week. So um, chapter three, eccentric experiences, um, and uh, chapter eight, charismatic enchantments. So we're going to talk about the charismatic tradition and its mode of enchantment. Um, and we'll talk about eccentricity in chapter three. <laughs>